My name is Naguset, and I'm proud to bring you a television show that highlights Aboriginal talent here in Montreal. In this episode, we feature Cory Daibo, a guitarist and a songwriter, as well as the inspirational Aboriginal Women's Project, featuring Monique Dykstra, the photographer, as well as Tilly Normandin, one of the inspirational Aboriginal women. This is a project that I helped create and support, and this is Indigenous Power. like a year of talking about this I in feel here. Like if it hadn't been for you, this wouldn't have happened. I had I had an idea that's a great idea, but you know what? If you don't have and it's not just you, this project everywhere along the way, everybody said yes, starting with you, most importantly, because you found funding for the project, you were enthusiastic about the project and you moved on it, which was fabulous. But I found after that, every step of the way, everyone fell in love with it and they all wanted it to happen and it just, you know, it just happened. I am a Montreal photographer. I've been a photographer for 20 years and we're in my studio in okay. Montreal and NDG where NDG. I shot all the photographs for the Inspirational Aboriginal Women Project. I started off, my very first project was, uh, it was amazing actually. I got a Canada Council grant right out of photography school to go and photograph and interview people living along the Yukon River. Okay. So they actually gave me money, thousands of dollars, wow. to get a canoe, go up to the Yukon, buy a canoe, and then I spent three months canoeing all the length of the Yukon River, up north through uh, the Yukon, then all the way across Alaska. We actually paddled through, like we went all the way through the Indian communities, the Athabascan. We saw the, the, the huge culture change from uh, Athabascan Indian to Yupik Eskimo, and then came out and then flew to the last few villages. And yeah, so you've got all this sort of Aboriginal stuff kind of in the background there. So I got the idea that it would be just a, something powerful and useful to create portraits of Aboriginal women that were positive mm -hmm. for a change. And that's why this project is so important, because in, if you pick up a newspaper, you can see yeah. the devastation every single day, but you never hear about what happens later on, that these yeah. women are able to go and get services and empower themselves and then do amazing things. Because none of these women were actual professional models, right? And here they are probably first time. Well, you know, nobody likes to have their photograph taken. Or really? You get to stand on a dollar because you're extra special. Oh my god. So then that gives us... It's like your mark. There's your mark. You know, so no one's used to it unless they're a professional. So okay. people are always awkward in front of the camera. This, this, what it does is the light comes here and it bounces on the thing and it gives you a number. They always think that they look stupid or too fat or too old or too wrinkly or too whatever. So mm -hmm. the the, the process is really just making sure that they know that it's a process and that 
the reason I'm moving them around isn't because they're doing it wrong. It's because we're just moving them around. We're mm -hmm. just trying this. We're trying that. Don't worry. Relax. And being, you have to be encouraging and really take the responsibility off the person and say, look, we're just, I'm taking the picture. It's not what you're doing. Like, I like a head nice and strong. Especially I on know, women, but because I have women. My chin, so I have to look down. You know what? Women do the kitten. Mm. Drives me nuts. Does it? It does, because it's not powerful. It's like, I mean, I am imposing my viewpoint on things, but women all do the kitten. When's the last really? time you saw a man do that? <laughs> right? <laughs> come into the picture. Okay, so we're going to come into the picture. Just lean towards me from the waist. I love your pictures. Yeah, they were fun. They're so grand. They look so grand and yeah. dignified, yeah. They're it's so great. big. It was really important that they be big, because mm -hmm. these are people that have been pushed around and beaten up and mm -hmm. pushed in the corner and ignored and lied to and cheated. And mm -hmm. and you know what? You can't push somebody that looks that big and that grand around. Oh, I saw in a movie or something, it's like an Aboriginal person who's like, don't take my picture, you're going to steal my spirit yeah. kind of thing. But you actually capture their spirit. Every picture actually oh. shows their personality, the happiness, the pride. Like you really captured something in every single, that's why they're all so amazing. It's, you did an amazing job. Thank you. Yeah, it really was, uh, was really uh, quite the experience. How do you feel about this? I have goosebumps. I am so excited. It's amazing to see the turnout of people that are here. It really is an honor to be standing amongst all these ladies. They're so beautiful. And I want the world to know that. My name's Teely Normandin, and I'm Mohawk from Gunnawage. Okay, so I understand you're an inspirational Aboriginal woman. Yes. And what I'd like to know is, how did this become? How did you, how were you selected as one, and what is your input with the entire project? That started many years ago, when I first met you. Uh, I think the year was 1999, and you were my outreach worker. Uh, on and off for a few years after that, we would be in touch and you offered all the services from the shelter, the Native Women's Shelter. I participated in some, but the biggest thing that really changed my life was when you told me about the program at Concordia mm -hmm. and you had faith and you believed in me. And that was, that was the, the basis for me pushing myself, really knowing that somebody believed in me, that I could do something. Because I remember when you signed that interview and you said, this is my dream. I used yeah. the services of the outreach and yeah. now I want to become yeah. the outreach worker. That oh, was, yeah. It was my passion. Yeah. It's, it, I was drawn to go back. Um, I just felt I needed to give back to the organization mm -hmm. that gave to me. And I don't look at it as work today. Mm -hmm. uh, I leave home to go home, <laughs> mm -hmm. to be with the women, to, to sit with the women, to listen to their stories, to help them out. It's, it's a passion. They went out for Halloween? Yeah. 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 Okay, so today we're going to have your appointment at 2 o'clock okay. at the Urban Service Centre of Montreal. Okay. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, ladies. Hi. How are you today? Good, good. Welcome. Good to see you. You too. Welcome to the Urban Service Center in Montreal. The biggest joy I think in my, well I know in my job, is uh, when I see how far a woman has come, how far sh she has progressed, mm -hmm. when she doesn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, because then I get, I get to sit with her and in her moments of despair when she feels that she hasn't really done anything, Hearing it from an outside person, I can tell her, look, this is where you were a year ago. Mm -hmm. This is what you have accomplished. And when she sits back and says, oh, yeah, that's right. And I said, see how far you've come? 
those are moments that I live for. So in terms of the Inspirational Aboriginal Women's Project, I know that you are one of nine. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about the whole process of choosing the women and how you were able to give your input into, because I know obviously you were number one, <laughs> but for the other eight, how did you come to that conclusion? Um, it, it was easy and it was hard. Uh, because I have such a long list, a big mm -hmm. list of mm -hmm. women, and they're all amazing women. They've all in their own lives made such big leaps and bounds. Um, it was difficult in a sense that I had to be careful who I chose, how it would affect them, mm -hmm. because in the end, they were the one that would be out there with their story and their photo. Mm -hmm. And there's a fine line between still the strength and the weaknesses so it's it's not something I wanted to play with because mm -hmm. it's, it's serious their life so in choosing the ones that I did um, I took into account who would be really comfortable in front of a camera mm -hmm. who would be more outgoing and be able to tell their story you had said that your story like you don't mind sharing it mm -hmm. that your story did you want to share it with the audience a little bit about um, well, basically, uh, in a nutshell, I was a young mother at 18. I have three kids, Becky, Kyle, and Matthew, mm -hmm. if I may say their names. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, uh, in a rocky marriage mm -hmm. that had its ups and downs, uh, there was uh, issues of addiction, of alcoholism, mm -hmm. uh, with myself and my spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't have an education when I was young because I was, was a stay-home mother. Okay. So after uh, some difficult times in my life with, with alcohol, with drinking, uh, my children were placed with family members. Okay. And uh, after working through those issues and going to rehab and attending meetings, getting my life back in order, kids finally came back to me and through this time I attempted to go back to school get my education mm -hmm. I was meeting with you mm -hmm. I was connected on and off with the shelter with the program uh, so in the long run it's it went like this mm -hmm. and you know finally got a job got an education I really have to say that something very important that I've kept in my life mm -hmm. is faith mm -hmm. and believing in myself. And when I didn't believe in myself and I wasn't strong enough, there was my family, number one, mm -hmm. that was there. And then there was you and the shelter. Really, it's, it's, and it's finding my Aboriginal roots mm -hmm. and getting in touch with my culture, my traditions. Um, How are you doing that? I attend sweat lodges mm -hmm. with, uh, with an elder. Uh, we have the elder that comes to the shelter. I speak with him. Uh, different conferences I've gone to. But are you also a fire keeper? Yeah, oh yes, yes, I'm a fire keeper at the sweat lodge. Like, someone who's come from a hard place and is as successful as you are today. Words of wisdom? Yeah. <laughs> uh, words of wisdom, wow. Um, it, it's such a cliche, but it's, it's don't give up don't give up and if you feel that you are going to give up lean on somebody mm -hmm. somebody that that's there for support I, I often tell my women you know when they say oh, I don't have any friends mm -hmm. or somebody find one person one person that you can really talk to confide in and that is strong for you when you're not strong that you can lean on them you know but don't give up Yes, there's hard times. Yes, you go down, but you know what? You can always come back up.
My name's Corey Daibo. Nation is Mohawk, and I'm a guitar player, songwriter. And you're from which community? Uh, from Kahnawake. Okay. So, how long have you been a guitarist, and when did that all begin? I like to think that I was a guitarist in a very young age, at around five or six, because I have an older brother named Keith who went away on a trip to Arizona, and when he returned, he came home with a 1963 Fender Stratocaster guitar. And as a child, of course, this black case comes into the home, and it's like, what is that? And the case opens, and I'll never forget the orange lining and this beautiful sunburst Stratocaster guitar. And I was like, and the first thing I heard was, don't touch. Oh, man. I think that's where it began, because it was like, the shape of it was just beautiful and curvy, like a woman, and it, you know, it was just, I had to touch it, you know, but I wasn't allowed. So. That's the one that we actually, my older brother and I bought together. How old are you in this picture? I would have to be 11 or 12 there. You look so happy in that picture. <laughs> the guitar is so big. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I still had it, but that's the guitar that started it all for me. Uh, the first live show I remember playing was, I was probably like 12 or 13 oh years my God. old. And this was with a, a neighbor of mine who was a very talented country singer. He, his name is Harry Rice from Gunawaga. Okay. So I was playing with him a lot. And he actually called me up one day and says, would you like to go and play a gig? And I was like, what's a gig? And he's like, well, we're gonna go to uh, the George Hills Golf Club Country Club and we're gonna play there. Okay. so. We made the arrangements and went there and we did it as a duo. And I'll never forget, we played one set and it was like on stage and we were really doing it. And we, you know, people were clapping after the songs. It was quite amazing. And before we could get on to do the second set, someone had called the police and complained that there's minors <gasps> performing in the bar. Oh my God. So it ended there. It was okay. awesome. When did you meet? this guy Jonas. Jonas. And he is my soul brother that I met later in life. He does all the things that I can and I do all the things that he can. Okay. As it started to gradually go on, uh, Jonas and I began to write music together. We, we, were, we started to realize that we were writing like, like uh, rock music, uh, pop music. When our first record was done, our first tour was opening for Van Halen across uh, the States. Okay. And we got to play Montreal, opening for Van oh Halen, God. our hometown. Oh, what an experience that was. It was just so great. Kahnawake came out in force. They were so happy. And after the set was done, it just went by too fast. I actually got off stage and I went in the crowd and I went through the whole stadium, the Bell Center, like saying hi to everybody so oh. that. Yeah. But it's, there's just, you know, ex experiences that money can't buy, you know, when you're touring with uh, opening for, you know, a bigger band. I got to play with Deep Purple. So I was like, you know, you just can't do that at home. <laughs> this is uh, serial number one. Uh, Mohawk cu Custom Amplification. These are the guitar amps that my brother builds for me, and he builds them on a made-to-order basis. Um, just love it. I toured the world with it. It's fun. Do you have anything that you want to share? I know that I've been asking all kinds of questions, but did I miss something that you wanted to let the viewers know about being a rock and roll star, an indigenous rock and roll star, words of wisdom. Be the singer. Be the, be the, really? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think I just like to always give a little advice, like, you know, just try to keep it a little bit straight. Don't get too carried away with uh, drugs or alcohol. And mm -hmm. just trying to be smart and do the best you can and care for other people, I think, uh, is pretty much the way to go about doing anything. So I think it 
should uh, happen that way in music as well. Thank you for watching Indigenous Power. Join us for more episodes on the diverse talents of Aboriginal people. Hooray!